So I'm here this afternoon uh, with Zeke Emanuel, who is the Vice Provost of Global Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania, and also a professor in both the Wharton School and the Perlman School of Medicine. And as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Zeke was very heavily involved with, the, with public health issues in the Obama administration, including the construction of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. In recent days, he's been omnipresent in the media, uh, both writing in the New York Times and on lots of TV outlets. And our students today were fortunate enough to hear from Zeke. So I wanted to I wanted to thank you first, Zeke, for thank you. all that you're doing. Uh, but but begin with um, begin with one of your headlines today to our students, which was eight weeks, not Easter. Could you talk a little about the coronavirus timeline in the United States? Uh, well, if you look at China, let's begin with China, uh, you see that when they imposed uh, restrictions, uh, the physical distancing in Wuhan and closed down the city, uh, cases continued to rise for about four weeks, and then they slowly, they peaked, and then they slowly came down to, they reported zero uh, just a few days ago. Um, so that's an eight-week cycle from the sort of the end of January to the end of March. And I think that's what you see when you really impo uh, severely impose these uh, physical uh, distance, um, restrict and quarantine people. And I think that's what we could expect. Uh, three weeks just isn't going to be enough. Um, first of all, we don't have quarantine throughout the country and we don't have the physical distancing. And it, it's just too short a time period. And what about the friendly amendments to that, uh, letting younger people be more active, be more out there, or some geographies over other geographies? How do you feel about those? Well, I do think young people are, look, they're not immune from getting this. They do get it, but they don't seem to get, uh, uh, they certainly don't seem to die. And how severe their symptoms are is uh, a little unclear. Some do seem to get severe symptoms. But remember, young people go and live with old people, older people. And so you might have a kid who's uh, 10, 12, or even 18 years old, and then going back home to their parents. And if they got the coronavirus, they would expose their parents. So that doesn't, that, that, that may not be a solution to this problem. It may be a solution if you can do it voluntarily and, and carefully. Uh, but I think it, it, you have to do it in a better public health environment and a better healthcare environment. And you can't have that by uh, three weeks from now. And what about the geography? So we cordon off New York as if it was Wuhan, but we let people in the Great Plains get back to work. Uh, how do you feel about that suggestion? Uh, well, that fails to recognize that the virus is everywhere. It's not just in New York. It's, uh, New York may be more severe because it's more exposed, more people traveling and more people brought it. Uh, but you can be sure that this virus is everywhere. And if you cordon off New York, that will not prevent Lincoln, Nebraska uh, or Kansas City from having a lot of cases that are percolating there now. We need social distancing for everyone everywhere. And one of the problems is New York is experiencing all the pain uh, economic pain and other pains of social distancing, but because of travel and because the rest of the country is not doing it, they're not getting the maximal public health benefit. To get the maximal public health benefit, to get the sort of Wuhan effect, you really need this throughout the country. You don't need a, you can't have a patchwork system, which is what we're doing now. And that patchwork system is undercutting the positive public health benefits. Okay, so that's very helpful. The, the big theme of your presentation to our students today was rationing, and you were basically saying that the, the the surge of the surge challenges in the healthcare system, hospitals, ICUs, ventilators, etc., are just impossible. Could could you talk a little about the reality of rationing, and then how you think we should do it? So, if you look at the number of people who are going to need ventilators. Um, given probable estimates, um, we're going to have more than 100,000, maybe as many as 500 or a million people might need ventilators. It's estimated that about 5% of the people who get infected will need a ventilator. Uh, maybe it's 2.5%. Um, so if you think that something like 50 million people get infected, and by the way, that's a low estimate, um, that would be uh, one out of every six people in the country. So that's a pretty low estimate. Um, 50 million people, 5% is, uh, um, uh, what is that, two, uh, two and a half million people? So maybe it's a million people need ventilators, something like that. Um, we only have uh, uh, 60 to 80,000 ventilators 
20,000 maximal in the um, in the strategic reserve. We have 90,000 that could be refitted to be full functioning. Right now, they're not uh, sort of state of the art. Um, so at most, you have 200,000 ventilators. And then you have the respiratory therapists who have to take care of the ventilators. You only have 75,000 of them. And each person can take care of maybe four or six ventilators. So you got a shortage of ventilators. you got a shortage of respiratory therapists. Um, that means that when they're a city has a very high level of COVID-19, you're going to have doctors and hospitals having to decide which patient gets on the ventilator. And the patients who don't get on the ventilator are going to, unfortunately, you know, probably die. And that's... So this is where we, this is where your other discipline enters. This is a classic correct. ethics problem. And you are walking through the, the various pathways there. I, mean, I don't think we can do a long ethics class, but what's your bottom line on how you think we should ration, what the criteria should be? So let, let me say that there are four main values at stake. One is maximizing the benefits. That's the key one. Another one is ensuring equality. A third is prioritizing the worst off. And the final one is giving benefits to people who have been socially useful both in the past and the future. So that gives you a, a sort of bottom line. We have to maximize the number of people we save and their prognosis, save people for the most life years. So young people who will live a long time should get some priority. Um, we also need to give priority to healthcare workers. They're in the front line. They're taking risks every day by caring for people. They're going to take risks if they if they get sick uh, and come back to work and we have to prioritize them for ventilators, uh, vaccines, therapeutics, whatever uh, needs to be distributed. Um, I think a third point uh, I like is first come, first serve is a bad allocating principle that you happen to be on the respirator or the ventilator first does not mean you should take it. If someone else comes in with a much better prognosis uh, uh, as a healthcare worker or some other reason, um, uh, I would also say we have to remember that different parts, modalities get different priorities. So a ventilator uh, might have certain priorities, like young people should have a priority over older people. But if they have similar if they have similar chances of a living, but for a vaccine, older people are at more risk of dying and you would prioritize older people to get a vaccine. So I think we have to be sensitive to which uh, item we're distributing and the rationing principles will be different. Um, the last thing I would say is COVID patients, people with COVID-19 have no entitlement to resources more than people uh, who have are sick from non-COVID diseases like cancer or heart disease uh, or multiple sclerosis. Um, you have to uh, ration uh, all the patients together. So it's not just considering the COVID patients, it's considering all patients together. And I think that's a very important uh, principle, which unfortunately at the moment seems to be not heavily emphasized in the debate. Yeah, and I, I certainly remember, I'm sure it was so painful for you in the Obamacare years when people started talking death panels rather than than this reality of rationing. But but right now we're, we're the government uh, is talking quite a bit about how to re reduce shortages by mobilizing two groups that we normally don't think of as being central to healthcare. So one is the story about the private sector and new tests. The other is the role of the military in building hospitals. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about those, about sort of yeah. all hands well, on deck? I, I have to say, I, 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 it befuddles me the approach that the CDC took to uh, this diagnostic test. First of all, there was an internationally available diagnostic test, which they spurned. They thought ours would be better. They tried to develop it. It took time. They then tried to ship it out. They made a mistake. Then they shipped out tests without the full reagents to run the test. Finally, they got the private sector in. And in the United States, we have these huge mega diagnostic corporations, Quest and LabCorp, that run literally tens of millions of tests every day, very highly automated, very precise. Uh, we've got a lot of private uh, uh, diagnostic test makers that sell to Quest. Um, finally, they allowed them in on this game, and, and we're seeing testing ramping up. I have to say, even more than surely, surely the number of tests, I think we need two things to change change our testing regimen. One, we need to pull the testing out of the healthcare system. It should not be done at hospitals. It should not be done in phys physician offices. That's a sure way to get doctors and nurses sick. We should have freestanding drive-through or walk-up 
testing clinics where people who are not doctors but trained to put the swab in in the right place um, uh, doesn't take a ton of training should be doing these tests. And I think that is critically important um, uh, to be done. And we need so on the, uh, on the military side. Can we jump to the military side? Yeah. I mean, having those military hospitals uh, off New York and off California, that's a great photo op. But do you think the the VA, the military, is a real asset as we as we take on the shortage, the shortage and rationing challenges that you've it, it's it's definitely a real asset in the sense that it's e it, it's the easiest way to get a thousand beds by putting that ship up there, um, and the. Uh, you can have these mobile units that the military can put up. You could see that China needed to put up 16 hospitals, which they did in a miraculous you know, few number of days, although totally inefficient and totally wasteful because they'll probably just uh, rot there and, and rust. Um, but I do think in, in these kind of surge situations where uh, you can see or anticipate that we're going to need more beds and, and, and things uh, like uh, ICU beds, the military can be helpful there. Uh, we don't have another substitute in the United States for uh, adding that surge capacity. Uh, as long ago as four weeks ago, I was talking about planning for the surge capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, it just it, no one in the administration seemed to be taking that sufficiently seriously. That's quite amazing. Four weeks ago is literally several eternities in the yes. world we're living in today. Yeah. Um, but now let, let's go uh, longer term, though. You, you've talked about this eight week period that you think is critical based on China. Let's go out several years now. Um, do you think that the, the coronavirus, the crisis and reaction is going to change the nature of healthcare provision in the United States? I mean, we've been talking telemedicine for a long time. Do you think that might be one of the consequences of this uh, ultimately? Well, I don't think telemedicine is the only change, but I do think we do need to heavily institutionalize the telemedicine. I think patients are going to get used to it. Doctors are going to get used to it. And they're going to figure out that there's a lot of things we can handle via telemedicine. Um, uh, and we don't need to bring patients into the office. And by the way, it's not just telemedicine. It's video, it's phone, it's texting, it's all of it. It's all the virtual stuff. So I do think you're going to see a lot of the routine stuff done uh, virtually, and I think that's a good thing, so that doctors can spend their face-to-face -face time more with patients who have chronic illness and really do need their attention, who are much more complex. The other side is what you're also seeing is that the threshold, for example, to admit to a hospital is going way up, um, and we're changing how we're doing it. And I think that's really important because if we can increase the threshold and get rid of these low value admissions, admissions where there's a very small chance that we're going to find anything on the patient and make that a permanent change, that will save a lot of money in the long term. The other thing that we're seeing is canceling all these elective surgeries. These elective surgeries are the bread and butter of hospitals, but a lot of them we're going to find out is, yeah, really didn't need to do it. Patient recovered fine. You know, their hip pain went away with physical therapy and they really didn't need that hip replacement. And I think if we can permanently put into place this sort of increase in the threshold for hospital admission and a reduction in the elective procedures, we will actually have transformed a lot of the medical care system. So I do think long term, this could be a way of really getting the healthcare system into a lower cost structure. It does require making these changes uh, much more permanent and much more built in to the culture of medicine. So let's end on that uh, on that positive note. Uh, Zeke Emanuel, thanks a million for your time today. Good. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you to all the uh, Wharton alumni.